thank you all of you and uh, welcome to this session, which I am very, very intrigued about. Uh, Jainism, insights into Jainism, Bahubali. Um, Devdas and I, and I have been friends for a very long time, but it's the first time we're sharing a stage together. So, congratulations on the book, Devdat. And uh, so let me start this discussion by asking you the most obvious question. Um, why Jainism? What motivated you to enter into this world, this fascinating universe of Jainism and write this book? Um, so the reason was, uh, you see, Jainis, Jains are less than 1% of India, yeah. but they contribute to almost 10% of India's GDP. Mm. And I f used to feel very awkward that India is overwhelmed by Hindu mythology yes. when we have so many mythologies. Yeah. And I thought I should focus, while I wrote articles on Jainism, I thought I should focus because there's so many learnings in Jain mythology which I'll share today. Right. But it has personally helped me live a better life. Okay. And so it's a very personal thank you right. to right. a wisdom. How wonderful, how wonderful. Um, also the title is very intriguing. You know, when you hear the word Bahubali, immediately what springs to mind these days is the Raja Mali movie, you know, <laughs> hyper-masculine uh, action and violence. Your Bahubali is a different Bahubali. It's a yeah. Kama Bahubali, a peace-loving Bahubali. Tell us about that. Uh, so that was one of the reasons we chose the title. Okay. Um, uh, you know, uh, so uh, especially the Digambar community, Bahubali plays a very important role. In the Shwetambar Jain community, he doesn't play an important role. So it was a decision because, you know, when young people talk about Bahubali, they think of a Bollywood movie and they think of a very violent, yes. you know, yes. hyper-masculine hero. And I felt bad that India's world's first non-violent hero is Bahubali and he seems to be eclipsed by Bollywood's violent hero. So I think at least people should know that our culture has the, you know, a non-violent hero which is unheard of yes. in civilizations around the world. So I think uh, the least we can do is remember Bahubali. Wonderful. Um, we all know that uh, Rishabh Dev is, of course, you start the book with Rishabh Dev, who is the first Tirthankar. Um, now, what exactly does the word Tirthankar mean? I mean, of course, when I see, hear the word Tirth, it, it gives an image of pilgrimage, but do enlighten us. What is exactly the meaning of that word? So, Tirth is a geographical phenomenon. So, you should understand, uh, it, traditionally in India, we, people would travel from one water body to another water body. So, they would travel and the moment a river would come, they would not cross the river. It was considered not proper to cross the river. Uh, especially if you are a mendicant. So the only way to cross a river is to take a boat or a bridge. But a boat or a bridge is created by human beings. So it's man-made, it's artificial. So a holy man in India uh, would never touch anything man-made. So they would not cross it. So they would look for the shallow part of the river where they could cross. You can just walk across the shallow part where there are rocks. That's called a tirth. That's the original meaning of the word Tirth and that is where holy men would stay. That is the place then the pilgrimage spot became, the temples emerge. So the Tirthankar walked that path but more importantly it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for cr crossing the river of life right. and figuring out, uh, you know, being calm and relaxed about life. And I think that's the best thing you learn in Jainism is that just calm down. Uttejit hone ki koi avashakta nahi hai. So I think one thing you learn from Jainism is how to be calm, composed and if you see the images and artwork of Tirthankars, they are very calm, composed uh, and you know Rishabh Dev we speak about, all the Tirthankars look the same, which means they have given up identity. I am not Rishabh Dev anymore, I am cosmic. So that all the 24 Tirthankars look exactly the same. The only reason the human being wants to say is it Rishabh Dev, is it Mallinath, is it pa Parshanath, they have symbols for our benefit, not for their benefit. So I think this is a wise, a these are unique, complex very, ideas. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, yeah. And I think uh, we are a country of these wonderful ideas yeah. and I, I, I love writing about them. Uh, how similar or dissimilar is the Jain concept of the Tirthankar with the Hindu concept of the Ishwar? I mean, is it also as cosmic a soul as... Uh, so uh, Hinduism is theistic, so there's the assumption that there is a divine being um, who sort of ha encompasses the whole world. Yeah. This concept does not exist in Jainism. So uh, while we use words like atheism and as a something which comes from the West, both Buddhism and Jainism do not acknowledge an all-powerful God. There is no concept of all-powerful God. In Buddhism, Buddha says, I have no patience with this idea. 
But in Jainism, they say nature has always existed. Anadi, Ananta. There's no beginning, there is no end. Right. And therefore, life continues and we have to engage with life. So they don't bother with the idea of God. There's no bhakti, there is no God save me. Okay. You have to take care of yourself. This journey is a lonely one. Right. All of us, there is no God out there to protect you. You have to do it on your own. And therefore, shrama, effort, you have to work with yourself. So, Shramana Parampara, work with yourself. And the idea of being alone, therefore the word Kaivalya essentially means extreme isolation. Can you sit in a room without being acknowledged or recognized? As a public figure, you know how difficult it is, right? You sit in an airport and nobody recognizes Devdat Patnaik. And you feel, oh my God, I have lost the mojo. Nobody. I'm sure that has never happened. <laughs> but that's what life is about. One day you will be forgotten and it's okay. Yeah. And that's what the Jains talk about and that's Shrama. It requires effort right. to deal with invisibility, to, to live happily even if nobody recognizes you. Oh. And I think these ideas, and they're written about what, 2,000, two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, for me, that's very uplifting. It is, it is. In fact, I think the concept of pride is something that Jainism really attacks in the sense that, I think attacks is too violent a word for mm -hmm. Jainism. The fact that the sense of ego, self-elevation is something that the Jain ethics is what talks about controlling that, which I think is what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, also, you know, Rishabh Dev was, was the first Tirthankar and what is an example of wonderful cross-pollination of cultures is that there are many stories of Rishabh Dev as the company of Hindu gods. So do tell us about that and maybe a story. Yes, uh, maybe I'll do that in sure, the sure. Uh, session. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, I have a speech prepared, so oh, let me okay. finish that. <laughs> my job easier, thank you. Uh, and so, I, I, I'll, I'll give a talk for a few minutes okay. and then, then we could maybe... So we'll talk about that later. All right, sure. Um, also, this whole idea of, you know, there are two schools of thought regarding the emergence of Jainism. Some say it came as a reaction to Hinduism because there was a stage when Hindu culture, Hindu religion saw a sort of decline and both Buddhism and Jainism came as reactions to yeah. that, which also led to a lot of conversions. Uh, Chandragupta Maurya yeah. being a very famous Jain convert. Another thought says that um, it emerged from Hinduism yeah. itself, from the Sanatan Dharma, from the very womb of Hinduism. So, which one is true? Um, see, this idea that Buddhism and Jainism is a reaction, and look at the words you use, convert, convert. These are European words, these are colonial words. And when the British wrote the history of India, they used the template of Europe to explain India. And they said, just as there's a Catholic faith, which was reacted on by the Protestants. Yeah. Hinduism has a reaction called Buddhism and Jainism. And they saw Buddhism and Jainism as a Protestant version of Hinduism. Okay. Now, these are 19th century colonial outdated ideas. Okay. Um, we can cling to it. Many sure. people love 19th century ideas like sure. antiques. Some people love antiques. Some people like colonial ideas. I would like to live in the 21st century. Yeah. And in the 21st century, we know that in the Bihar, Jharkhand, what is called Greater Magadha area, hmm. Ideas emerged on their own amongst the mercantile community, mercantile, not agricultural right. community, right. who spoke of karma, who spoke of very different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. So, Ajivikas, Jains, what we call Shraman, they really emerge in the eastern part of India. Mm -hmm. And these are original ideas which sort of intermingled with each other. You know, it's really a political arrogance that it, it, you are an offshoot of my faith, yes. you are a reaction of my faith. This is me giving myself too much importance and we should be very careful of the ego. Right. Ego seduces us and destroys us. Yeah. 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 If you really want to have wisdom and you want to understand knowledge, ego has to... Mm -hmm. You have to see data for what it is. Yes. Um, not for what you would like data to be. Right. Right. And I think if you really want to be successful as a thinker, you must allow data and knowledge to frighten you mm -hmm. and shock you and reveal beauty of life. Yeah. yeah. yeah? Wonderful, that's wonderfully put. Um, another, I remember seeing one of your podcasts on the book and you said a very fascinating thing that you understood the concept of Vaikuntha better after writing this book and after becoming aware of the ethics of Jainism. Please do enlighten us. How do, does, do that, that again is for the podium. Okay, yeah. all right, wonderful. Uh, so uh, also, there are supposed that. to be, uh, okay, I'll just end one last question. You can then take the stage. Uh, there are supposed to be Jain Ramayan and, you know, Jain Mahabharat as well. Yes. Do those books expound a different set of ethics that is more in conjunction with the Jain worldview? Yes, it is. The, the Jain is, uh, so there are, uh, you know, you find Jain Ramayan, lots of Jain Ramayan, written in Prakrit, Kannada, Ardhamagadi, uh, very 
different in uh, uh, ideas. Uh, you find uh, Jataka tales which sort of sound like Ramayana, they may not be. So we, there are, India is a land of stories and the different stories were told to explain different ideas. Yeah. Even when we say Ramayana, there is a Valmiki Ramayana, yes. there are other Ramayans. Yeah. Even Valmiki has multiple uh, things. So the broad idea is about talking about someone who is steadfast. So Ram is the steadfast. And what is steadfast in Jainism is very different from what is steadfast in Buddhism. What is steadfast? So idea of integrity, commitment, that is non-negotiable. So when we talk about Ram, we talk about that. So you have to read them in the spirit in which they were written. And, they were, uh, and some ideas come from Jainism which is not found in Buddhism, in Buddhism which is not found in Hinduism. So it's like a Venn diagram. So depending on what you want to pick and choose, you pick and choose. Yeah, I think you have a speech prepared. Thank I think you. we all want to hear that. Thank you. Please. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I have a habit of giving speeches. So sorry, Satya, I was interrupting you. Um, it's better. Yeah. So my name is Devdat Patnaik and I write on mythology. And I always begin my sessions by explaining what is mythology, especially because around the world, and not just in India, mythology has become history. And I want to separate these two subjects because they're two very different subjects, which means there are two different departments and two different job opportunities. Because head of department of history is very different from head of department of mythology. Should you want to start a course like that? And I will put my application for it. So what is the difference between history and mythology? There are three big differences I want you to draw your attention to. History deals with the past. Mythology deals with the past, the present and the future. So it's timeless. It doesn't talk about the past. Although people assume the mythological books talk about the past, that's not true. It's timeless. It's talking about ideas. It's not talking about events. Events are simply a vehicle to communicate an idea. So you should focus on the idea, but vehicles make it interesting. Second, history deals with facts. Now, what is the definition of fact? Fact has to be everybody's truth. And everybody's truth is defined by measurement and evidence. So measurement is very important, especially in science. But in the humanities, you don't really have many measurements other than in economics. You need facts which are measurable. Uh, you need evidences which can be provable that this is a, a evidence. This, can, this happened like an archaeological evidence, an inscriptional evidence, a textual evidence. Mythology is based on beliefs. And belief is somebody's truth. This is the definition of belief. The simplest definition I can give you. Somebody's truth. Which means... Every person is entitled to their own subjective personal truth. Every culture has its own truth. There is no universal truth out there. If somebody tells you there is a universal truth, they are lying. Every culture has its own truth. And we are entitled to it. We must believe that and respect that. That is an important idea to understand mythology. So for mythology, you don't debate and argue. You will notice that I don't participate in debates. People are so eager to debate with me that they actually take my videos, do reaction videos, put it on national TV and call it a debate. But a reaction video on a national challenge which is supported by people who don't understand debate is not a debate. I don't debate because mythology is not about so mythology is not about finding one truth, the truth. It is about finding your truth and uh, expanding my truth. And therefore you don't debate, you have dialogues. So it is not vivad, it is samvad. And samvad is Upanishad. That is Upanishad. I listen to you, you listen to me and our ideas expand. So that's the second point about mythology. The first point is mythology does not, is not located in time. The second point is mythology deals with somebody's truth which is limited to a culture and is belief. 
so you don't argue with it you listen to it and understand it and third point and that's very important in india it's very specific to india the origin of the word mythology has nothing to do with the sanskrit word mithya i heard these people shouting at me mithya se mythology they think british took the word mythology from the indian word mithya which means falsehood or delusion that is like saying demography the subject of demography originates from the sanskrit word damru you know or saying biology comes from bhaiya so biology doesn't come from bhaiya demography doesn't come from damru and mythology does not come from mithya mythology word comes from a greek word called mythos and logos mythos is stories that explain and logos is analysis that explains so one is analytical and one is narrative so that's the difference so in order to understand jain mythology which is the book about mythology you have to understand what is the cultural truth it is expounding and in order to understand this cultural truth i will first take you on a slight journey i want to talk about western mythology because many people in india are horrified that mythology seems to be only about hinduism and indians no it's not true every culture has mythology so western world today is based on christian mythology islamic mythology greek mythology norse mythology and if you're a student of mythology when you see the battle going around in the um, western uh, in the eastern edge of europe right now there's a terrible war going on and it is to understand it you just have to read mythology and suddenly you will realize the meaning of words like promised land the idea of prophecy the idea of justice because the idea that there is an all powerful god who is just the idea of judgment day or qiyamah these are not objective measurable scientific facts these are mythological concepts that shape the world judgment day does not exist in hinduism buddhism jainism it is not there there is no concept of qiyamah there is no concept of prophet or paigambar these concepts don't exist because indian mythology is based on the idea of rebirth rebirth so the idea of justice i have to tell people sometimes who get very excited we are atheists we are atheists i said do you believe in justice and they say yes we believe in justice i said do you believe in equality they say yes we do i said do you believe in human rights they said yes i said do you know all these three things are beliefs they are matters of faith <laughs> these are not facts just because you like them just because you like them they are as mythological as gods and goddesses of mount olympus right now people say i go to the temple because one day god will listen to my prayers that's exactly what you say when you go to the high court and supreme court one day justice will come we believe in justice we believe in equality we believe in rights and that is what shapes our culture none of these concepts exist in nature no animal or plant will beg for justice or equality no animal will say i demand rights for rabbits the rabbit community is an oppressed community and needs to revolt and for the sake of our rights we will indulge in terrorism you have never heard of sheep and goats saying in an act of self defense we will do a genocide against wolves animals do not know these concepts these are human ideas property this land belongs to me is the greatest mythological concept invented by human beings tribal communities do not have private property and therefore in this context of understanding christian mythology islamic mythology greek mythology let's understand jain mythology because jain mythology will tell you a different way of looking at the world which might be startling in today's generation 
So Jainism is about ahinsa, non-violence. That's a foundational principle. Unfortunately, in India, when you use the word non-violence, people think it is about eating vegetarian food. So the laziest form of non-violence is to say I am vegan. So I can not pay my employees. I can run away from India, stealing the money of India and go to London. But I'm, I'm a non-violent person. I may beat up my wife, I may beat up my children, but I'm non-violent because I eat vegetables. Now that's a very lazy definition of non-violence. And I feel sad because Jainism talks about ahinsa at such deep and profound levels. Recently, I was giving a talk on Jainism and Ahinsa and a gentleman said, are you saying, Devdat, we should turn the other cheek when someone attacks me? And I'm like, that line is from the New Testament of the Bible. That's not from Jain Agamas. Why are you confusing Old Testament of the Bible with the Jain concept of Ahinsa? Because you've never read Jain scriptures. I had not written my book then. Now they can read my book and understand. Then people say, well, the answer to life is an eye to an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But if you do that, the whole world will go blind. And I say, that's the Old Testament. So you are referring to Old Testament of the Bible for violence. You are referring to the New Testament of the Bible for non-violence. Where is Indian mythology? Can we focus on Indian mythology, please? And Indian mythology is about rebirth. So let me tell you a story from the Jain mythology to explain what is Ahinsa in its finest form. One day, Mahavir Swami, the great Tirthankar, the last of the 24 Tirthankars, was meditating. And while he was meditating, suddenly, uh, he was completely lost to the world. He was in his inner world. He was in his inner thoughts. When a cowherd comes to him nearby and he says, have you seen my cows? Have you seen my cows? And Mahavir is not hearing him because he's lost in contemplation and meditation. He doesn't hear anything. He's not even aware of this cowherd. So the cowherd looks around for his cows, doesn't find the cows and goes away. After some time, the cowherd comes back and finds his cows grazing around Mahavir Swami. He says, oh, there's my cow. This man who is meditating over here obviously knew where my cows are. Maybe he's the thief who stole my cows. And he gets more and more agitated and he starts yelling and shouting and screaming very much the way we do it on social media today. And this poor cowherd screams, yells and Mahavir Swami is completely oblivious. He's just sitting there doing his dhyan. The guy gets so agitated because Mahavir Swami is not rep responding. He takes thorns from a tree and he says, you're not listening to me. Are you deaf? And he puts the thorns in Mahavir Swami's ears. He pierces the eardrum and blood starts falling off. Mahavir Swami still does not react. He's still in his own thoughts. He's not even aware that his body is being tormented so. The cowherd goes, goes away. After some time, a group of merchants come and see the sage sitting there and they see him bleeding. They feel sad. They call a doctor, they remove the thorns and they wait and Mahavir Swami is not even aware of that. He's still meditating. Days pass, he eyes open up and then people, he sees people around him looking at him, strange creature who did not respond when he was being accused of theft, who did not respond when his ears were being pierced, who did not respond when he was being helped. And they looked at and he said, what happened? And they explained the event and Mahavir Swami says, cruelty is spontaneous. Kindness is also spontaneous. People can be cruel for no reason. People can be kind for no reason. So don't be angry with cruel people and you don't have to be thankful to kind people. This is life. Accept it for what it is. This is Ahimsa. It is not turning the other cheek. Because I'm not responding to you. It is not about saying, because turning the other cheek is about trying to shame you. I want to control you. I want to shame you into being non-violent. 
it's like it's a common thing nowadays everybody wants to shame people into becoming whatever they believe is the right way to live mahavir swami doesn't do that he says violence is a consequence of consumption the more you consume the more violent you will be we consume food and because we consume food we destroy forests we destroy animals we destroy the world we want to create fields because we want food we want to indulge and feed our ego and therefore we are violent we insult people we humiliate people we are jealous we are angry because we want to nourish our ego so if you want to truly be non violent you have to outgrow your hunger and your insecurities people fight the enemy outside that is a veer a brave man but the great enemy is inside your hunger your insecurity your fragility when you fight those you become mahavir the great <laughs> nowadays everybody wants to be a veer a heroic being they want to defeat the enemy they want to i see guruji is who get great pleasure in demolishing opponents in debates and i'm like oh my god kitna hinsa how much violence this violence is not just physical it is also psychological mahavir swami wouldn't do that he would say i don't need to demolish there is battles inside me these creatures my jealousy my anger my frustration these the my greed how do i battle that that is ahinsa because hinsa is an outcome of consumption the more you consume the more violent you will be the less you consume the less violent you will be and how do you consume less you practice so they have practices like fasting you fast but it is not just physical fasting it is also psychological fasting can i spend one day without my cell phone can i spend one day without being acknowledged by friends and neighbors can i spend one day without being jealous of those who have earned more than me that is difficult that is what bahubali talks about bahubali was a great hero and the story of bahubali is very interesting once upon a time there was a king rishabdev and he had 100 sons and he gave 100 sons a 100 kingdoms equal distribution and he told everybody be happy of course human beings will never be happy with what they have they want more because isn't that what we have been told stay hungry stay foolish all mba classes tell you you should be hungry till the day i die it's glamorized we have glamorized greed and called it ambition ambition is the good word for greed and so you consume and so the eldest brother says i don't want to be with one kingdom i want to be the ruler of 100 kingdoms i don't want to be a king i want to be an emperor and so he tells his brothers please bow to me otherwise i will attack your kingdom and the brothers say no violence is not good so 98 out of 99 brothers become monks and they go to the monastery and say you take our kingdom we don't want to fight you bahubali is the second brother he refuses if i should i bow to you i'm happy in my kingdom you should be happy with yours why can't you be content and his brother says no i have done mba <laughs> i'm not allowed to be content billionaires are still looking like hungry wolves who have not had breakfast that's what i want to be that's my aspiration and so the brother comes with his army to fight bahubali and bahubali looks at his brother and his for the first time his commanders are very smart they go to the two kings and say you know what you have to sort it out between the brothers why should the soldiers fight why should soldiers die because you cannot handle your ego and your ambition and the brothers are sensible unlike modern politicians they say that we don't want we don't want to fight the soldiers to fight we'll fight amongst ourselves so the war is turned into a duel the war is turned into a duel and the two brothers fight and there's a lo long description of the duel and every time bahubali wins bahubali wins bahubali wins at one time they have to punch each other and bharat punches bahubali and bahubali doesn't get hurt he's very strong that's why the mean the word bahubali means a mighty man mighty limbs and bahubali then raises his hand to punch his brother and when he's about to do that he says what am i doing i'm going to hit my own brother 
what kind of madness is this he says i will not hit my brother but then he unfortunately has the strange kshatriya code if i have raised my hand i must strike something you know the rajputs have this idea that if the sword is removed it can only be taken back into the scabbard until it is stained with blood if not other people's blood then my own blood this is a very strong warrior code he has this warrior code he has raised his hand to hit his brother and he says okay i will not fight the other i will fight the self and he plucks his hair and becomes a monk but there's a problem so there he is the non violent he becomes a monk but now there's a problem he does not want to bow to his eldest brother but now when he goes to the monastery he has to bow to his younger brothers 98 of them he said oh my god in the material world i have to bow in the spiritual world also i have to bow all the monasteries have hierarchies senior monk junior monk supreme monk in the making shri 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 108 1008 all you know there is a monastic order has a huge hierarchy if you have met a monk you will see it it's very difficult you can wear orange clothes you can smear your face with ash but you love people bowing to you and that's what bahubali realizes i don't want to bow to this monk i don't want to bow bow to the king why do i not want to bow and his two sisters brahmi and sundari who gave india the writing script his two sisters brahmi gives us the brahmi script sundari gives us mathematics so in jainism all writing and mathematics come from women very few cases like that and they tell him the answer is simple brother you are sick. get down from the elephant and so what is it and he realizes the elephant she they are referring to is the elephant in a state of must a male elephant which is sexually aroused which is called elephant in rut is a very dangerous animal when aroused it doesn't think of any it's very violent until its desire is satisfied it's called the elephant in must mother mother is the state of intoxication when you are hubris the closest word in english is hubris you become arrogant and you want to destroy the whole world for your own pleasure and that's where he is sitting on he is the must he is the elephant and he says oh that's it i have to conquer it and therefore he becomes the mahavir and the symbol of the mahavir is a lion and the lion sits on top of the elephant so if you go across india not just jain temples hindu temples buddhist shrines you will see images of a lion on top of an elephant that is the mahavir crushing the elephant in rut which is our ego which believes consumption will bring happiness consumption will not bring happiness contentment will santosh the one word which is not taught in schools colleges mba academies is contentment when i talk about contentment in mba colleges i am cancelled because sir we want people to stay hungry stay foolish that's not the jain path and if you want to know more about jainism please buy my books <laughs> or be content with the stories i have told you thank you thank you <clears throat> i think we can all agree that how enlightening that was but uh, you still did not answer the question that i had asked so how did you comprehend the concept of the vaikuntha through jainism i mean it's a fascinating uh, synthesis of two cultures understanding a hindu concept of vaikuntha which is supposed to be the highest abode where lord vishnu mahavishnu stays through the lens of jainism so when you talk about shiva and vishnu the imagination says there are beings in the world who don't seek anything so vishnu doesn't seek anything vishnu doesn't have ambition when you read the ramayan ask the question what is ram's ambition there is no ambition he is just doing his job does krishna have ambition no he doesn't uh, because he is the word used in sanskrit is achutta achutta is someone who is content now if you are content will you engage with the world so the question comes is if i am content why would i engage with the world 
because this assumes that the purpose of life is only to consume and those who only believe in consumption when their content won't work but the scriptures say that the purpose of life is to feed the hungry so vishnu is feeding the hungry he is saying i am not hungry you are hungry so i'll provide you food the moment he gives you food the next concept comes you are in his debt if you are in my debt you have to repay the loan and as you know when you repay the loan you should always do it with interest so remember jains are a financial wizards they invented banks they in the invented mutual funds so they said the character who gives investment then the return comes but i don't want it because i'm content right so what do i do when i'm content all the investment will go back into the market and i'll keep coming back so lakshmi is constantly invested investment is generosity but it has to always come back because you have to repay your debt otherwise you'll go to narak you'll go to hell debt in hinduism debt is not a place where you make gods angry hell is a place when you are in debt you know that when you have an emi and people are knocking at your door debt so in order to be debt free you repay the loan and the money keeps coming so when money keeps coming to you lakshmi keeps coming to you and you have the ocean of milk so you are so rich so in jainism and hinduism the secret of infinite wealth is contentment which is the very opposite of capitalism where the secret of invest because see the rich man today is making money for himself he is bakasur bakasur is the opposite of bahubali i mean not the bollywood bahubali yeah, yeah. but the jain bahubali bakasur is hungry wo apne liye kha raha hai his zillion dollars is for him nobody asked the question for whom are you making money the rich man is making money for himself you are just his cattle he wants you to be cattle so that he can milk you but when shri krishna talks about golok when they talk about vaikunt they are saying no this milk has to circulate i am not hungry i have conquered my hunger you are hungry i will feed you but the story that's charity no it's not charity it's investment you have to repay the loan because if i don't repay the loan you will go to narak hell so hell is for the ones in debt the only so there is narak which is for the people in debt there is swarg or paradise for the people with equity but jainism and hinduism will say narak and swarg are for foolish people the true true place which in jainism is called siddhalay in hinduism is called vaikunt is the place where you are at peace and you are only at peace when you are content when you are generous and when you are resilient and that's what they're talking about so it's a very different way of looking at the world it's not about being right and wrong it's not about making money it's about being content and i work with rich and powerful people and i have not seen contentment anywhere i once was in a private jet and it's a story i tell everyone in the beautiful private jet this man says dev that life is so unfair <laughs> and i agreed with him because my invoice was on his table <laughs> never disagree with the rich yes. never if you want your bills to be paid <laughs> so we have to deal with the elephant mm. these rich people for me are the elephants in must right. decorated with diamonds and botox <laughs> and i have to deal with the botoxed elephant with jewels on them right. and that's life you're surrounded by this crazy must hathi mm. who can trample you and crush you because they are so and they are not evil yeah. they are just sexually aroused and you can't satisfy their desire they will just crush you because they want the next female they want the third female they want it more and more and more because this hunger which we have glamorized is what indian scriptures have warned against be careful it will destroy the world it will destroy the world you need to be at peace with your hunger so that's what it is yeah wonderful also i believe another very uh, central ethic a very central tenet of jainism is not to get entangled in the karmic cycle so um, which um, kind of could be paradoxical for i'm trying to understand it because on one hand of course we're talking about a thriving financial community and yet you're talking about not getting entangled into day to day affairs so how does how do, how, how does one navigate this uh, almost an oxymoronic situation 
so the question is for whom are you doing business that's a simple question to ask am i doing my business for myself and for my own pleasures for my family for my 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 so the possessive pronoun my which is human invention it doesn't exist in the natural world it's a language anybody who understands language will know the possessive pronoun my your ye my land my property my family these are all symptoms of the ego so they are saying while doing because you are in a merchant family you have to do business while doing business how do you conquer this which will based on how you take decisions because the more content you are the bigger risks you will take the more content you are the more long term gestation of your wealth you will do things for generation 1 2 3 4 you'll say i'll not get immediate benefits and it's perfectly fine and if i don't get benefits you need returns but sir returns why are you thinking about returns is sir i am not thinking of returns for my sake that person doesn't repay the loan he goes to narak but when the wealth comes to me i'll reinvest it in the market i don't want it so this is not entangled in the balance sheet of yamraj right, right. the balance sheet is not me i don't go around saying the person that you know i am worth 70 billion dollars i am i don't look at fortune 500 list and say am i on top or second or third or fourth and i don't get palpitations because today i'm not the richest man in the world i can walk away and nobody recognizes me and that is what the tirthankars do they are coming from super affluent families they walk naked and that's a metaphor digambara is a metaphor for someone who has shed everything they are not paigambars paigambar has a message the paigambar wants to convert you he is telling you turn the other cheek persuade you the digambars are not interested they are not giving any message they are saying this is the way life is figure it out yourself and there is no hurry right we have infinite lives yeah, yeah. so next life yeah. next life what is the hurry if you want to stay hungry stay foolish you have infinite lifetimes to change your mind okay. Okay. so indian thought that's why gods in india are always smiling <laughs> they look at foolish people and they're like oh look at ravan so educated yeah. but still so stupid doesn't understand a woman's consent next life next life next life what's the hurry the gods have infinity right. ananta remember we all talk about indians invented zero we also invented infinity and the denominator of our life is infinity and when the denominator of your life is infinity your value is zero and that's what the scriptures are saying that's digambara digambara understands infinity and therefore knows what does it mean it means that the if you disappear at this moment mm. the world will continue without you yeah. think of the richest man right now or the most powerful man right now or the person you hate the most if they disappear will anything happen to the world nothing mm. nobody will remember and human beings this is existential angst when the tree burns in the forest you don't know it may be the best tree in the world it may be the most powerful tree in the world but it is you don't even know the tree is burnt so the digambar is saying life is sanatan hai this is the meaning of sanatan not to feel ye ye triumphalism i have won that's a very primitive and childish understanding you know you want to have a pedestrian understanding good for you but if you want to have a refined understanding please read devdat patnaik <laughs> you know uh, hearing him i'm reminded of a story uh, that i came across in the purans and just giving you a bit of a break <laughs> uh, which you'll find in mahagatha so again it is about pride and self elevation so the vindhya mountain is one of the most uh, you know it's a famous mountain in india and once the vindhya heard narad being the trouble maker comes and tells the vindhya mountain you know sumeru is taller than you and way more beautiful and uh, overnight vindhya could not sleep how can a mountain be taller than me more beautiful than me and the next day immediately he starts you know increasing in height and so much so that he blocks the sun and the sun's chariot can no longer walk around the earth so of course there is panic and chaos in earth and the gods try to bring him some sense but vindhya says nothing so i am now the tallest i now i'm now in rut to 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 uh, court devdat so then finally agastya the saint he comes over and he says the only way to deal with him is with your mind and intelligence and the sage comes and tells vindya you know you are he first of all starts with flattery because that always works you are so tall you are so beautiful but you know i have to go south 
would you mind lowering your slopes for me so that once you are lowered, let me cross it and remain in the lowered state. I'll be back in a jiffy and you could again increase your height. Bindya agrees because the flattery has worked. It lowers its slopes. Agastya crosses across the south. The mountain says, come back soon. I'm waiting for you. Uh, the saint goes, he creates a hermitage there. And uh, so now the sun is all around us and Vindhya is still waiting for Agastya. <laughs> so I guess yeah, that's what it is about. Um, okay, one last question. The temples of, Jain, you know, of Jainism, the kind of intrigue architecture that one comes across there. You said that the temples, there was a, there was a message that the temples give. That is, the, it's a way of also, it's not just about art, but also imparting values through architecture. Tell us about that. Yes, so um, the oldest Indian temples are really Jain temples. It's something that people forget. Jainism really valued art a lot because remember at the time they lived, 99% of people were not literate. It was a pre-lettered society. So the, how do we communicate Jainism? Jinnah Vani should reach people. These ideas, these grand ideas that we have has to reach people. And they said, okay, let's do it through art. And therefore they sponsored art. But it's very interesting, while they sponsor and therefore you find Jain temples everywhere, this was also a way of ensuring employment to the artistic community. So now, they would always say, that the Jains have this uh, idea that the, in the temple, there should always be the sound of the chisel and the mortar. The sound of the chisel and mortar should always be heard, otherwise your business will collapse. Now people think this is, now they take it as superstition. Yeah. They'll keep making that sound thinking now my business will be successful. What they're trying to say is, as long as you are successful in business, you will have extra resources. As long as you have extra resources, you will fund these artists and they will have employment. Right. So your wealth will sustain art. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're trying to explain. And to ensure the artist does not short sell himself, they would say you have to sieve. The, uh, the, the grain of sand which falls on the ground so that the finest artworks emerge. So if you see the Ranakpur temple, which is, uh, we are in Jaipur, but if you go to Udaipur and you go to the Ranakpur temple and you see the temple over there, thousand pillared temples, yeah. it's an outstanding work at architecture. But what is important over there to remember is we do not know who built it. Even the person who sponsored the building has a, they were said we should put a statue. He has got a tiny statue, barely six inches tall. And he said, put me in the corner so that I don't come between the Tirthankar and you know what is interesting, between the Tirthankar image and me, which is not the way readers do today, right? They want all their posters everywhere. The, the Ranakpur Seth, wow. who built it, yeah. you will not, you have to search for his image. Corner may little, little image of him. Okay. But more importantly, he played a very clever trick. In front of the Tirthankar statue, he's put a Kalpataru paint, a beautiful image saying that that's a leaf of the Kalpataru. If you stand under it, all your wishes will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And he told his people, most people who come to my temple will stand under this seeking. Okay. They will rarely see the Tirthankara oh, who has given up everything. Right, 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 right. So this is art has been used to communicate the human dilemma. Right. And you see when you go to Ranakpur, you j and there is no puja, there is no part, there is no giving, no prasad, no prasad nothing. Yeah, yeah. You just, it's art. You look at art and it inspires you. The way words inspire you, the words, text. The Jains realized art is inspirational. Right. I think that's why they are the richest community in India. Absolutely, absolutely. And both of us come from Orissa. We know if you go to the Jagannath temple, how the pandas fleece you. <laughs> so I think this is so refreshing to so, hear. So uh, uh, the oldest Jain uh, king is Kharabel from Odisha. Yeah. And even today we use in Odia words like Durbikya, mm. which are Jain words. Mm. Famine is described as a time where you're so poor that you can't even give food to the monk. Wow. So that is the meaning of famine in Odia, right. Durbikya. Right. So the Jain monk would come and if you can't feed a monk during, that means your famine has come. Mm. Oh, so anyway, right. that's an Odia note we must say. Mm. So, <laughs> Do we have time for like uh, question answers? No, I don't think so. Oh, are we? No, Can we take like one question maybe? One quick question? Okay. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Nidhish Goyal from Jambu Talk. So, as you said about to the difference between Pagambar and Digambar, that uh, Digambar has uh, no issues and Pagambar is like to convert. So, do you meant to say like uh, uh, all the Pagambars of Islam and uh, Christianity, they are uh, to convert the world with their political ideology or is there is any other thing as you said about Hinduism, Jainism and uh, Buddhism, but there is not about anything uh, Christianism or Islamism. Thank you, sir. Maybe you should think about the question and you will find the answer yourself. Thank you.
I'm sorry, we have time only for that much. I'm sure he'll be off dice. You can have all your questions answered. Thank you for being a very wonderful audience. Thank you.